Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of No More Silos. My name is Erica and this is my podcast. Hey everybody, welcome. I am glad that you have decided to join me again. As we are nearing the end of the year, I've been finding myself very intentionally, very specifically trying to wrap things up, slow down, determine what can wait till the new year and all of that neat, cool, fun stuff. But I'm also thinking about the fact that to me, and this could be you too, but to me, the end of the year often feels like the middle of the year, like the halfway point. And I realize it's not exactly a halfway point. I believe it is a little bit off, but for me, the year, the new year really starts in August or September. Um, well, traditionally growing up, school for me started in September. In New York, it was always that first Wednesday after Labor Day. But here in the South, um, it is August. It is middle August, then it was early August. One year it actually started in July because the way that the days fell, the start of the week. And so, uh, so my kids only know August through May. And what's interesting about that is because when you think new school year and you think new year, January, really it's kind of arbitrary, isn't it? Uh, when you look at other cultures, uh, like the Jewish culture, it's at the end of September with Rosh Hashanah, Chinese New Year's, the end of January into February. Um, everybody's got a different start to the year. And for me, it I, I, the new year, according to our calendar, really falls in the middle of my year. But it's also an opportunity for me to slow down, take a break, assess how things are going. Where do I want to be by next summer? What do I want to be doing by next summer? And I guess the other part of it for me too is my birthday is in June. And so that is my new year. So I guess we all have our own New Year's Day, which is our birthday or whatever day for you kicks off newness. It could be spring, it could be fall, it could be winter. It could be summer, whatever it is for you that just kicks off that new year, thinking about what that is. And so I've been thinking about that a lot lately. So last week in my effort to try to take more intentional time and rest, and I guess, oh gosh, I probably will talk about this on another episode. I'm working on a series going through the theology of Hebrews, and I have two episodes recorded. I just haven't uh, posted them yet. But one of the things that I noticed in my research is the Sabbath has no end. And and you may be familiar with songs uh, that talk about it, uh, but it's not something I really noticed. Uh, it's not something I noticed before. The Sabbath actually, the Sabbath day, the seventh day doesn't have an ending in Genesis. You can look that up and check it out. It doesn't have a day. So when Jesus says to us that come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, coming to Jesus, coming to Christ means operating from a place of rest. And so it's not just which day of the week or picking a day of the week to rest on, but it's really living a lifestyle of rest. We don't have to be productive every single day or every moment of every day. And as a mom and formerly a homeschool mom, it is so hard to find rest. Um, I have to pick times during the day where I say, you know what, I'm just going to take this afternoon off because I don't have anything scheduled. Nobody needs anything from me from the next couple of hours. I think I'm just going to watch a movie. And so last week I, I did that. I just picked a day. I was eating my lunch and I said, you know what? I'm going to watch this documentary on Disney Plus and just really relax and enjoy my lunch as opposed to eating my lunch and working or eating my lunch and then getting up and getting right back to the grind, but saying, you know what, I've got to do better at 
this, and and that's part of the check-in, I guess, do better at a lifestyle of rest, better at a rhythm of life, better with a Sabbath rhythm. And so last week, what I chose to watch on Disney Plus was a documentary about Indiana Jones. Yep, that's what I watched, Indiana Jones. And as I was watching the documentary, I didn't realize that there were five movies in the franchise. Yes, five. It may be a surprise to you too. I don't know. Maybe not. I, maybe you're a little bit more well, uh, aware of what's going on in the world than I am. But yeah, so this year, earlier this year, Indiana Jones Part 5 came out. I think it, the subtitle is Dial of Destiny. And so today's episode is all about spiritual formation and rest and things you could be doing over your holiday break to have those spiritually forming conversations with your friends, your family, your teens, your spouse, whoever's in your life. Because one of the things that sparked with me after I watched all five of these movies, yeah, I did sit down and watch all five of them, um, because I hadn't seen the fifth one and it was on Disney plus, but I didn't want to want to watch the fifth one. I'm a Marvel fan y'all. And and you may have heard me talk about the Marvel movies on this, you know, you got to watch things in order in order for it to make sense sometimes to really catch all the details. And so I decided before I could watch part five, and then I realized I had never seen part four, I needed to go back and rewatch parts one, two, and three, which meant I was deep diving back into my childhood. And it was, it was really, it was really interesting. So, but of course, me being me, no more silos filter on, I was looking at it and I go, you know what? This is really a lesson in spiritual formation. It's an opportunity to look at how events that we engage in, shared experiences that we can engage in with others, build community, give us a shared experience, give us a platform to talk about spiritual things. And there's so many people in the world right now who, um, according to the book, The Great Dechurching, um, So many people subscribe to the idea of, I used to go to church. I am de-churched. And that is a big part of our mission here at No More Silos, is really connecting the dots for people who are deconstructing and reconstructing their faith. And folks who are de-churched fall into that category. I used to go to church, but now mm, I had a bad experience or it just didn't connect well with me. And so, or I wasn't discipled well, all of those things. So how do we, how do we take something as entertaining as the Indiana Jones series and apply that to spiritual formation practice, uh, to, uh, apply that to discipleship, to apply that to conversation starters about God and about history and, Without ever, may, well, actually, you might want to open your Bible on this one. I'll tell you why in a moment. So, what started out as watching a documentary on Disney Plus while I ate my lunch turned into me uh, really thinking through the busyness of the holiday season and spiritual formation. In fact, there's a book that came out back in March by Jessica Houghton Wilson called Reading for the Love of God. How to Read as a Spiritual Practice. Reading for the Love of God, How to Read as a Spiritual Practice. And in her book, uh, she talks about how literature in general, now she's not talking about movies, but she's talking about literature, reading books. Maybe you're in a book club and sometimes the conversation sparks a spiritual connection. Um, Sometimes you, you question, wait, did that author really quote the Bible or did they misquote and it was really culturally Christian or did they they get this wrong? And so she talks about reading and how reading can take us into thinking through our spiritual practices, our spiritual formation, uh, can impact what we think about. Uh, someone else talked about it on online around the time her book came out, and I was hearing about it on a podcast I was listening to, and they were talking about how uh, he, this person was talking about how they read a book about trees, and this book about trees really made them think about God. And the book was was literature about trees, but it was science and it was uh, poetic. It was uh, visually 
stimulating in the sense of just helping you think through you know, the cycle, the life cycle of trees, you know, you have the spring buds and flowers, and then that gives way to the leaves and the fullness of the summer. And then in the fall, the leaves drop, they turn color first, and then the leaves drop off. And the trees aren't dead, they're more or less hibernating in the winter. And how those seasons and the seasons of life and and all of this is is biblical, right? So when we think of literature, we can think of that in the context of spiritual formation. But we can also think about the movies we watch, especially movies that are a whole franchise and series like Star Wars or Marvel, or in my case this past week, Indiana Jones. And one of the things that, that I observed as I was watching the Indiana Jones movies is how Jesus taught using stories. We call them parables. A parable, uh, the word parable uh, etymologically means placing alongside of for the purpose of comparison. Um, A parable is a story pulled from the pages of real life, from the context that the people in the audience would understand. Preachers do this all the time to this day, uh, teaching like Jesus taught with stories that their audience can identify with. And what we realize is that's what a lot of our movies are. That's what the writers are getting at. They want you to walk away with something from that movie. Um, And then sometimes the movies, their context doesn't last. Um, There's a lot of memes going around right now about the Home Alone movies. Here we are 30 years later, and the Home Alone movies, as fun and entertaining as they are, so many questions from my 12-year-old when she's watching it, like, would you forget me? I would just call you from my cell phone and let you know, hey, you guys forgot me. Um, You're tracking on the cell phone. I know where my kid is. I realized that they didn't leave with me. Um... The, you know, the, the alarm system or the police knocking on your door or the ring cameras that we have now, all of that just throws the whole story at, on Home Alone, uh, just tosses it around. And so while it's a, a great story, now you're taxed with figuring out, well, what, what can I take from this today? And that's the thing about parables. When I teach on parables, I talk about how um, some parts of the story may not be necessary to the central meaning of the story. So if I'm reading a parable of Jesus, uh, one of Jesus's parables in the Gospels, or I'm watching a movie like Home Alone, where some parts of the story just don't don't add up in 2023 the way they did in the early 1990s um, because of technology and changes in society. Uh, but what can I take away from it? You know, and, and the main thing is, is our family loves us. Uh, we love our family. Christmas is about that shared community time together, um, about love it, that's our cultural Christian view of Christmas, hope and love and faith and community, right? All of that working together. But when I'm thinking about Jesus's parables, uh, I'm looking at the social and historical and cultural context of the parable. Um, for example, it helps to know in Luke 18 that the that first century widows often experienced significant hardship or oppression. And so that parable in Luke 18 about the persistent widow tells me, uh, has, has an application to the people who were in the original audience that they would have understood because of their cultural context and their social proximity to the person described in that story. Or even the prodigal son. It's, it's funny how the prodigal son, while I was growing up, was taught a certain way, that parable. But by the time uh, in the last several years, as I have... Uh, studied more myself and on my own, I'm reading it and I'm going, mm, I don't, there's more to it than just at what we think and, and looking into the history and the context and all of that. So when we watch movies, especially series like the Santa Claus series or um, even the Home Alone uh, parts one and two, although I think there's four of them, but I don't know if that 
extends that far <laughs> with the storyline doesn't doesn't keep up. Maybe Star Wars, um, definitely the Marvel movies. There's all these connections we're looking for. The th- other thing that we're looking at in Jesus's parables are what are the number of points each parable is intended to teach? And it might be linked to the number of main characters that are in the parable. So sometimes even in Indiana Jones, there's a character that's there that shows up in multiple movies, but then there's a character who we only see in that one episode, that one movie. Um, consider who the parable is directed to. Is the audience being addressed? Is the audience being addressed? The disciples, the twelve, um, the Jewish leaders, the crowds. Uh, identifying who the audience was for one of Jesus's parables helps us in, helps us understand and indicates the message that the parable is intended to communicate. When we read the parables, oftentimes immediately following the parable to the crowds or to a group or perhaps to the Pharisees, the uh, the disciples will circle back to Jesus later and say, yeah, so uh, what did exactly did you mean by that? And Jesus would explain it maybe in plainer terms as opposed to a story, uh, comparatively speaking. The other thing that we want to look at is symbolism um, and repetition. Uh, symbolism is going to be important because we don't always understand the symbols that are present in the historical context of, uh, of Jesus's time of the first century. So it's important to kind of do our homework on that. Um, are we talking about God in the sense of father or king or judge or shepherd? Um, you know, what is the symbol or allegor- uh, allegorical uh, influence that's, that's happening there? And when we talk about repetition in the parables, well, when these were written and written in Greek, uh, it was written without punctuation. It was written without indentation of paragraphs. Um, there's no way to, there was no underlining bold or italics. So repetition in ancient Near Eastern literature was the way that we understood that something was highlighted or emphasized if it was repeated. Um, we get a lot of verily in the King James, we get a lot of verily, verily, I say unto you, um, Jesus saying, I'm telling you the truth. Um, listen to me. Um, if you have friends that speak other languages, you'll notice they'll, they'll say something like, oh, you got to listen to this. Listen, listen, let me, let me tell you what I'm about to tell you. And it's a way of emphasizing when the messaging was happening verbally. And that's something for us to take into consideration. So the messaging is happening verbally. It's uh, one of the things about that, that, and we'll talk about this when I get, when you get to the episodes that I'll post about Hebrews. Hebrews was a letter, but it was meant to be delivered like a sermon. And so the ebbs and flows of the way the content is shared, it was an oral presentation. And so when you think about Jesus's parables, guess what they were? They were an oral presentation. It was designed to visually drive the story home, visually give you something to think about. And so in the same way, we're thinking about these movies. What are we, what are we looking at? What are things that are repeated? What do we get out of that? Um, and then the last thing when I'm thinking about Jesus's parables is noting the conclusion of the parable. Who is the last person, the last action, the last saying that conveys, uh, this, uh, conveys a message in the parable is that what is significant or most significant about the parable. And so, you know, it's resources like logos.com are great or your commentaries are great for helping you uh, parse out what's going on in Jesus's parables. Uh, common fe- a few common features of Jesus's parables are they're always introduced with a question. Um, He spoke uh, many of his parables in response to a question. Um, Sometimes they answer a question, and that question, like, who is my neighbor, or what is the kingdom of God like, or how often shall I forgive my brother? Uh, Jesus' parables often use everyday images. Um, Sometimes there's nameless characters because there's a broad application, or sometimes there's a generic name like a rich man. Um, Sometimes a person gets a proper name. Um, 
A lot of times they talk about or describe the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven or its citizens. Um, And presenting in the parables, the kingdom of heaven is often presented as both a present and a future reality. Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And theologically, we see that throughout the book of Hebrews. There's a certain degree of what's going on now, a tension between what is now and what is later. What is now and what is later. And so when we when I was watching Indiana Jones last week, uh, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and the fifth one, I think I started around Monday or Tuesday and as I was able to find moments of Sabbath rest, I just chillaxed on the sofa and watched this movie. And sometimes I had to stop it and put it on pause and get up and go pick up a kid from school or cook dinner, do whatever I was doing, whatever uh, work things I was doing, making reels or uh, updating the church website, whatever I'm up to that day. When I had moments to rest, I was watching the Indiana Jones movies and talking to whoever was in the room about it, whether it was my teens or uh, someone that stopped by. It's an opportunity to have these spiritually forming conversations. And in the iconic movie franchises like Indiana Jones or the Marvel Cinematic Universe are great for this because Even if someone's never seen one of them, they have a little bit of knowledge about it because it's just kind of out there in our culture. So in Indiana Jones, one of the things that we see, a big um, overarching thing, uh, is this quest for truth. Indiana Jones is an archaeologist, and the movies, the first ones are set in the 1930s um, between World War I and World War II, and the bad guy in the in these movies is Nazi Germany. Um, before they got completely out of hand, or as they were getting completely out of hand, one of the things that they were doing is they were racking up all of the archaeological finds. They were going around uh, just getting all these ancient artifacts, and what they were doing with them? I have no idea. That's that's a quest for another day. But I do know that I've caught a couple of documentaries over the years on History Channel where they're traveling to Argentina to go look for Nazi gold because apparently that's where Hitler hid it all. Um, or people running, uh, trying to not get caught after Nazi Germany falls um, in World War II. They go and they hide their treasures in the mountains of South America. But Indiana Jones, as an archaeologist and a teacher, he is uh, living in two worlds. He's living in a world where he of academia, where he's teaching people about this, but he's also out there going and doing. And isn't that what we do with church sometimes? We are going to church, we're hearing the word, we're learning, we're being equipped so that we can go out in the world and help people um, find truth, find this this quest for truth. Indiana Jones does this with his iconic fedora and whip, and he mirrors an archetypal hero. Um, and he goes on this journey. And maybe it's a spiritual pilgrimage, maybe not. Maybe it's a pilgrimage for him just because he's looking for something. And in the first one, he's looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And what's interesting about this is in the movie, one of the things that hit me is it reminded me that the journey often holds more value than the destination. Now, I'm going to try to talk through this without giving you too many spoilers and the off chance that, like me, you had not seen the movies in a long time and really didn't remember the entire plot sequence. Um, But I want to point out some things that I want you to think about if you do decide to watch the Indiana Jones movies or broad ideas to think about as you are watching maybe the Santa Claus movies or a Hallmark movie or whatever with your friends and family over the holiday season looking for that uh, quest for truth. Um, In the Marvel Universe, we have heroes, we have sacrifice, we have redemption. They often um, face an extraordinary challenge. There's themes of sacrifice and redemption that echo profound Christian narratives. Um, And so that may be embodied by characters like Iron Man or Captain America. Not to say that they are um, always, uh, or that they are, Jesus-like characters, but to say that 
it gives us a platform to say, you know, would you do that? Would you fight to the death? Would you give up your life? Would you change your life completely for the greater good? You know, things that inspire us, characters that inspire us to live lives marked by love and courage and sacrificial service. If we start starting there, maybe it's not such a big jump that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And understanding that the cross was the Roman electric chair um, as hu- and, and full of humiliation, like standing in front of a firing squad. They just didn't have guns back then. And how gruesome and painful the crucifixion was. And how t- you were up there as a criminal. That's what Jesus was up there as. I mean, we, we forget sometimes because we're so far removed from that time. And because in our country today and in our understanding, we're, we're not, many people are not fans of capital punishment. Uh, some are in theory, <laughs> others not so much, but there's that debate of capital punishment. And you're sitting there going, Jesus suffered the worst kind of capital punishment of his time. And it was gruesome and it was painful. And there's, and, and that's what made his resurrection so impactful because his body would have not only from the beating that he he took on ahead of the cross but his body would have collapsed on the cross in a way that he would have been like a scarecrow um, trying to walk around later. Um, the reality of his resurrection that the amazement of that was how broken his body had to be uh, in that suffering on the cross. Um, Then there's the transformation through trials. We see this in the Indiana Jones movies as well as Marvel and even in um, the Star Wars series. We look at how these transformation or transformative journeys marked by trials and tribulations mirror our our own lives, Um, how it can encourage us to grow through adversity, that I'm not the same yesterday because I survived. As we wrap up 2023, here we are three years beyond 2020, and 2020 for so many of us was such an awful year. But many of us survived. If you're listening to this today, you survived. What did you survive? What can you look back and say how I got over? Um, One of my favorite gospel songs from back in the day, um, I can look back over my life and see that I have a testimony to share. The 90s gospel song, you catch my drift there. So we have this opportunity when we're watching movies, especially movie series like this, to see the, uh, the, the entirety of someone's life. When I'm, uh, one of the things I was uh, thinking about when I was teaching the discipleship class uh, that I was teaching this past fall or this fall, earlier this fall, is the life of Mary. We see Mary from the beginning of the Gospels as a young woman who makes a commitment to go all out for God. Like, yes, I will. I Whatever you say, God, I'm, I'm down for whatever. And she is Jesus's disciple. She is a follower of Jesus from the womb beyond the tomb. She's there throughout his childhood, raising him uh, in their, in the Jewish tradition. She is uh, raising him um, according to God's word as she understands it. She is there when he starts his ministry. She's there throughout his ministry. She's there at the cross when he dies. She's there in the upper room when the Holy Spirit comes and the church begins. She's there for all of it. Can you imagine? And one of the ways we can see that is when we look, when we watch a movie, we can help connect the dots for our friends and our family watching with us and say, From the beginning of the origin story to the end, how all of this happened, you see the change, you see the transformation and what they go through. And what we see in Mary is an unwavering trust in God throughout all of her life's challenges. And 
that's something that you can connect that dot for somebody just watching a movie, right? Um, the symbolism and allegory of decoding our cinematic messages. One of the things that I love to do after I watch one of the Marvel movies is I love watching the YouTube videos because they point us to the symbolism. And that, to me, is what Bible commentaries do for us. If you are studying scripture or studying theology, reading the commentary. Now, there's commentaries that are good commentaries, and there's commentaries that are not so useful. Commentaries that are not so useful are commentaries written anywhere between the 1700s and the late 1800s. Why? Because they were very, very, very much, especially the English ones, influenced by slavery, influenced by uh, the age of reason, the Enlightenment era, and uh, sometimes can get a little wonky in their theology. Um, I would look at commentaries that were written in the last uh, 40, 50 years. I would look at an exegetical commentary. Exegetical commentaries, no matter what denominational flavor they come from, oftentimes, uh, you know, they may have some commentary that leans towards that filter of that denomination, but an exegetical commentary is still going to tell you the history, the theology. It's uh, going to tell you what it says in the Greek and uh, and give you that analysis um, pretty straightforward. That's one of the things that I found most beneficial about my seminary education was learning to do an exegetical study because of the fact that you're asking questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how about the text and telling in the text is telling you what it says, not me, uh, putting it through my filter and then saying, this is what I think it means. And so that's one of the things that, uh, is fun to watch these videos where they're telling you what you missed in the Marvel movie or whatever the movie happens to be. And so what's interesting about the Indiana Jones movies, the five movies, in this quest for truth, we see the life, the span of Indy's journey um, to understand the world around him and his journey to understand himself, his journey to understand um, his mark, the mark he's making in the world. How is he How is he making a difference? Um, My husband says this in his daily uh, Facebook prayer. He says, you know, make someone's life better simply because you exist. So how is he making things better? What is he doing? And that is an existential question that many of us may be asking. So real quick, without doing too many uh, spoilers here, I want to share a little bit about some of the thoughts that I had as I was watching the five movies. The first one Indiana Jones is looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, um, for those of you uh, not as well-versed in Bible literature, is an Old Testament story of the Ark, uh, literally a box that God gave the Israelites instructions on how to build, very detailed instructions on how to build it in the Old Testament, um, a box to put the tablets of the Ten Commandments in this box. And so you can read that part of the Bible story in the Bible. And then one of the things that happens at some point in the Old Testament is the Ark of the Covenant, um, it gets misplaced, (laughs) it gets lost, it gets found, um, it is in the temple, the temple gets destroyed, it's not in the temple, they carried it. Um, But the Ark of the Covenant has uh, is is carried at the at the front of the line when the Israelites would go into battle, and so it's the the cultural Christian folklore of it that's it's part of the plot of the movie is that it has magical powers uh, for whoever possesses it. Now, if you jump ahead to modern archaeology and modern uh, uh, views about the Ark of the Covenant, there are some who say it is uh, it is in fact missing. Uh, nobody knows where it is. Um, there are some who say that it is with the Ethiopian church in Ethiopia, and they've got it, and they're not telling anybody where it is um, and won't let anybody have it. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, it, there's a belief that uh, it, it, it 
nobody knows where it is. So it makes for a great movie plot, right? The Ark of the Covenant. Now, here's the irony. The bad guys in the movie are the Nazis. This is, like I said, before uh, 1930s, before World War II, but after World War I, the Nazis are, are rising to power. And they're going around collecting all these ancient artifacts. The irony is the Ark of the Covenant is a Jewish relic. And in, for people who are not fans of the Jewish people, I find it kind of odd that that part of history, it's like, why were they going after it? And I did make myself a mental note that at some point when I'm bored again another day, I'm going to go and find out what their fascination was with uh, with all these artifacts, what they really thought they were going to do with them. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know what they were going to do with them. But the first one is about finding the Ark of the Covenant. Um, the second one for me, was a little hard to watch because there was a lot of screaming by Kate Capshaw in the very, I guess, first 30 minutes of the movie. Um, And that was a little off-putting. But I get it. When this one was made, uh, also in the early 80s, um, they were hearkening back to the uh, damsel in distress motif in... in, uh, in cinema and film, and so I think there was, you know, a an artistic reason for having her scream so much. I personally found it annoying, but this one was about an Indian Hindu cult, I think, um, some kind of Indian cult that involved child labor. Um, what it did, what my big takeaway here, though, was from a no more thinking through the no more silos filter is I have an appreciation for other cultures. Movies like this, uh, as well as documentaries, help us understand the value that other people place on their cultural artifacts, on their lifestyle, and that we all place a value on the next generation and how important that is um, for a community to thrive and to grow. Um, I also observed in this one that it's not just Christians that can go off the deep end and go left on their theology and start making stuff up. It happens in other religions, and I think it's it's important for us to be aware of that because we sometimes want to categorize someone uh, or label them negatively around the world and say, oh, well, that person is, uh, you know, is this, but we're going to label all of them this because of that one group, when really that one group is actually an extreme group that has an alternate theology and believes something completely different than everybody else. And so it's important to to understand that. And I think the second uh, movie in the Indiana Jones art, um, franchise really helps us kind of see that with this. The third movie, um, we uh, bounce back to the Bible. And this one, he is looking for the Holy Grail. And it's interesting because in the last 30 years, there have been a bunch of movies uh, where the plot is about looking for the Holy Grail or even the Ark of the Covenant. Um, There was the movies based on the Dan Brown books back in the 90s. Um, There was a lot of scholarship around Mary Magdalene um, for a while there that uh, was sparking a lot of movies and documentaries, um, the uh, Freemasons and the um, Knights of the Round Table, the uh, movies that we have uh, and shows that we have now about the um, Crusades and the Knights Templar. All of that is Holy Grail lore. And what's interesting is is in in the Indiana Jones installment, um, Looking for the Holy Grail, the question is, what does everlasting life really mean? Why would anybody want it? And and what's the value in having everlasting life? What do you do with that? Um, that might be a question that you ask while you're you're having this uh, this fun watch party. Um, why do people need something physical to represent God? I mean, seriously, this whole quest for the cup that Jesus drank the wine out of at the Last Supper. I get it from an archaeological standpoint. I find it challenging to think that anybody had the presence of mind to hang on to it in that time period for a whole host of reasons. One, because the history and and the mythology around the Holy Grail doesn't kick off for about 300 years. And so it's a non-starter conversation for a while. Um, 
makes you wonder, like, okay, did somebody just make this up? But they do answer, not answer, but do give some interesting answers uh, in the movie to the quest for the Holy Grail and its value. Um, So there's that. And then there's uh, worship throughout the Middle Ages in European history transferred to the Americas in parades like the Mardi Gras Carnival in the Caribbean um, and South America and by the way, you could look up the history of Columbus Day here, how we got Columbus Day. Um, it all starts out of some of uh, leftover from the uh, medieval carnival-like um, parades for Catholicism, Roman Catholicism at the church, and how we celebrated holidays and how it, this is where a lot of the the pagan rituals come into play that are not in the Bible, but we do them because it's tradition. And so when we think of holidays and why we do stuff, a lot of that is is can be traced back to some of this uh, relic worship. In fact, even the Protestant Reformation, one of the issues that Martin Luther had um, in 1517 was the issue with the Relics, the sale of relics. You know, they were selling little slivers of trees, of of twigs, and saying this sliver of wood came off the the cross, and it's imbued with the Holy Spirit and magical powers. And people would buy these things because they believed it came. It was a piece of the cross. And again, it maybe it's possible, maybe not. But why do we care? Why do we care so much to have this thing when there's nothing about Christian belief that should lead us to wanting to have a thing in our hand to worship? Um, The fourth and fifth one, uh, now these were new to me because I hadn't seen them. The fourth one came out in 2008. It's post-Cold War. Um, We're not thinking about the Nazis anymore. Um, We are thinking about the Russians, though. Uh, because again, Indiana Jones sticks with their timeline. And so even though this movie came out in 2008, it picks up uh, somewhere in the range of uh, the storyline for Indiana Jones. Uh, So he's, I believe, in the 50s in this one, 1950s. Um, But timing and story timing wise, it actually made me think about the craze back in uh, the late two, early 2000s where we were looking at the Mayan calendar ending in 2012. Remember that? I mean, they even made a whole movie just about that. The Mayan calendar ended on 2012. And so we thought the world was going to come to an end then since obviously it didn't come to an end in Y2K. And, uh, but it begs the question, you know, do we really think we're the only beings that God made? I don't know. Maybe, maybe you have some thoughts on that. Not really a theological question, but I wouldn't run away from that question. I think sometimes the church, we, I think we don't, we don't take seriously people's genuine questions. I, I think if I'm someone who is new to the faith or maybe I'm dechurched, I'm wondering, well, what about the aliens? And were the continents connected? And did people travel from Africa to South America? We have so much uh, historical, archaeological evidence of all of those things. Well, maybe not the aliens, but even the even NASA now is starting to acquiesce that, yes, they have captured, they do have some unidentified objects that they're not really sure where they came from. Um, and they just don't know. Because One of the things I find limiting to European history is that European history is limited by where the Europeans went. So they tell the history from their perspective, and that's the history we're told, as opposed to the history according to the people in the various places around the world who lived it, who may or may not have had a written language at some point, and so it's oral history. And unfortunately, sometimes we discount oral history as being mythological when maybe it's not so mythological. The fifth and final one, Indy is 80 years old. It comes out this year. He's retiring. He's looking back at his life. 
I think that's a great spiritual formation conversation. If I look back over my life, um, my husband recently has done a actually a few funerals in the last few months. And uh, depending upon if I knew the person or not, I will go with him. And one of the things that whether I'm, whether he's preaching the funeral or someone else is preaching the funeral, they often talk about the dash. It's a popular story. I don't know where it came from, but the dash between the dates, your born date and your, your uh, end of life date. And what we know about people, what we know about even Jesus, has more to do with the dash than it does with his birth or, well, with his death. That's, a, that's the big story there with Jesus. But most of us, when we die, the people here don't see us anymore. And so one of the books that I'm looking forward to reading um, that I haven't had time to read yet is Sky Jitani's uh, What If God Was Serious um, About Heaven? It's a new book that's out. So this last installment is about time travel. And time travel is my favorite movie category on Netflix. It is, I will watch anything that involves time travel. Um, what do you think you could solve in your life or in history by going into the past? I mean, that's a, that's a real question. Something I think about, like, would I make this change or would I leave it because the decisions I made after that bad decision were actually better decisions that got to me, got me someplace where I really wanted to be. And if I hadn't made that bad decision at the time I made that bad decision, maybe these other good decisions might not have happened. So that's the, the question of time travel. And there's always somebody who wants to go back and change the past for the best or the worst. And, but it's interesting because, um, this time it's we're at the end of Indy's life and he has one more adventure in him, one more quest for truth. And this time the question of truth is a little bit different than the previous times when he was looking for the Ark of the Covenant or the stone um, or the Holy Grail. And so I want to encourage you to think about the marriage of faith and film and how the movies we watch, especially the series where we can span time and see see the spiritual formation or uh, discuss themes and values and the moral dilemmas over time, how that's a really rich resource. Um, we see ourselves in these experiences. Um, they can serve as parables for our own faith journey. Um, it gives us an opportunity to embrace the lessons that are woven into the fabric of these stories, allowing us to have a deeper understanding of God's truth, but also shaping us into the people he's called us to be. And when we think of things from the standpoint of no more silos, how cultural Christianity impacts our lives, sometimes we think about it in the negative. But I want you to look at movies this holiday season and say, what is positive? What is a good thing that I can get out of this movie series? And what good conversation, what um, shared experience can I embark on with my kids or my husband or wife or my loved ones? while I'm Sabbath resting over the next few weeks. So thanks for listening. Um, and I look forward to you joining me here on No More Silos for our next episode. Follow me on Instagram at Cultural Christianity. Also check out our Patreon page where there's resources being added weekly uh, for you, uh, for our paid subscribers. And thank you if you are a paid subscriber. And thank you if you're not a paid subscriber, but just following along to see what, uh, what I'm up to. Have a great rest of your day and be blessed.